Welcome back to Good Law, Bad Law. My guest today is Scott Ruske Kidd. He's a senior staff attorney with the Center for Reproductive Rights, and we're talking about an extremely important and timely issue, the retirement of Justice Kennedy, the pending nomination of his replacement, Judge Brett Kavanaugh, and what is the state and future of Roe versus Wade. Really important conversation, and we really get into it in depth in ways that you really won't find anywhere else that uh, the media is trying to cover this extremely important issue. You want to listen to this episode to understand better what really is the stake. Stay tuned. I know you'll enjoy it. My guest today on Good Law, Bad Law is Scott Ruskay Kidd. Uh, Scott is senior a senior staff attorney with the Center for Reproductive Rights. Scott, thank you very much for being on Good Law, Bad Law. It's a pleasure. So we we join in this conversation today at a very important moment in uh, our Supreme Court and in our country, really, on the issue of abortion, uh, the future of the Supreme Court's landmark decision in 1973, Roe v. Wade. And so we're going to talk about uh, liberty, the 14th Amendment, abortion, and what is the future of uh, these issues with the retirement of Justice Kennedy. So uh, thank you, Scott, again, for being on the program to talk about these important issues. I wanted to begin, as we always do, if you wouldn't mind, by having you give us a bit of background on yourself and on uh, the organization you work for, the Center for Reproductive Sure. Uh, first, thanks, thanks again. It's uh, w- wonderful to be speaking together today. Uh, uh, I work with the Center for Reproductive Rights. I uh, graduated from uh, Harvard College and Columbia Law School and clerked for um, uh, two federal judges uh, in New York, and uh, at the moment, uh, my job with the Center for Reproductive Rights is to work on developing new legal theories, managing strategic alliances, and strengthening the jurisprudence that protects reproductive rights. Uh, the Center for Reproductive Rights is a vanguard global uh, legal organization dedicated to advancing women's reproductive health, self-determination, and dignity. Uh, We've got about 170 professionals with headquarters in the U.S. and uh, offices in every continent uh, except Antarctica. Uh, We've been around for about 25 years, um, and the driving force between uh, many of the most significant legal victories ensuring access uh, to reproductive health care across the globe, um, some of which we'll talk about today, others um, which we won't. Um, we were hard at work in Ireland supporting some, some recent uh, mm. fantastic developments there. In Africa, we, we were deal with children getting kicked out of school because they're pregnant, um, uh, and many things all across the world. Um, in the U.S., we address the full spectrum of reproductive rights and health, um, contraception, safe and legal abortion, uh, maternal health, uh, alternative reproductive technologies like IVF, um, the full gamut of, of reproductive mm-hmm. rights. Now, I, as listeners of this podcast and, and those familiar with me know, when I, before I was a lawyer, before I went to law school, I was a journalist, a, a writer, and editor in Washington and New York. And this is going back a few years now to the 1980s, but I bring this up because some of the issues that I was writing about 30 years ago relating to uh, judicial selection and particularly the naming of the justices by president, uh, what, you know, raised the, the very issues that we're going to be talking about today. So I, I didn't mention that because this issue future of Roe v. Wade? Will it be overturned? What will be the fate of uh, the right to choose when it comes to reproductive issues, and particularly abortion? This has been a hot, hot issue politically and in terms of uh, our federal judiciary 
for a long time now. So why Scott is today, why is the retirement of Justice Kennedy and the pending nomination by President Trump of Brett Kavanaugh to replace Justice Kennedy, why is today uh, so important and uh, potentially so uh, you know, so uh, dramatic in terms of what change may be coming. Uh, so give, give us some background on where we are today and why today really matters on these issues. Well, Justice Kennedy's retirement is devastating news at a divisive time in our nation and on the Supreme Court. Uh, Justice Kennedy was uh, nominated by um, Ronald Reagan in the late 1980s and has been, uh, for most of his time on the court, uh, a a swing vote. Uh, He has ruled uh, most often um, with other uh, conservative justices, but in uh, key situations, um, uh, he's emphasized uh, very important principles of liberty, equality, and dignity. And a justice committed to those principles is needed now more than ever. This is not just a uh, Supreme Court nomination. This is a Supreme Court nomination for the pivotal pivotal swing seat on the court, which will determine uh, potentially for decades um, many issues of great importance to millions, hundreds of millions of Americans' lives. Uh, President Trump... uh, has uh, promised to nominate uh, Supreme Court justices who will overrule Roe versus Wade, which uh, guarantees the constitutional right uh, to abortion. Uh, he chose uh, his nominee from a list that had been vetted um, by groups uh, familiar with uh, the, the candidates' positions on issues. Uh, And President Trump's promise should set off alarm bells for anyone who cares about women and the Constitution. Uh, Well, we're going to and we're going to we're going to go through the background of uh, the landscape, so to speak, when it comes to uh, Roe v. Wade and the importance of that case and and many other issues the Supreme Court has taken on that that have relied on Roe v. Wade. Um, But. You know, there's there is a history in our in our uh, it, uh, it, there's a history when it comes to the Supreme Court and presidents nominating people they think are going to be reliable on a particular issue or to follow a particular judicial philosophy or legal philosophy being being very disappointed once those individuals actually get to the Supreme Court and enjoy lifetime appointment on the federal uh, court, the highest court. Uh, I mean, famously, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, a Republican, you know, nominating William Brennan, thinking he was appointing a conservative, and Brennan goes on to become, you know, one of the great liberal justices in, in all of the Supreme Court's history. So uh, without getting too much into the details of Justice Kavanaugh, or the, Judge Kavanaugh, because he is a judge right now and not yet a justice, what, uh, say a bit more about why uh, a Supreme Court, or, or say a bit more about how the Supreme Court is divided on this, on these issues, on this set of issues, and why a seat filled by someone who very well may turn out to be uh, reliable in the way that President Trump and his supporters want this new justice to be could be so crucial in terms of how these issues get decided. It's an interesting history you point to. Uh, about past decades when our country was less polarized by party and uh, Supreme Court nominees sometimes surprised the presidents who appointed them. I think that's much less likely to happen today. Uh, A couple Mm -hmm. of things have changed. Uh, One is uh, the nominations process uh, has become uh, much less transparent. The hearing that uh, the public can watch where the candidate answers questions uh, has almost turned into a form of kabuki theater. Uh, For example, Mm -hmm. when Justice Ginsburg was 
appointed, she spoke about abortion. Uh, these days, uh, the nominees routinely dodge questions. It's a myth that they can't ask be asked questions about their views. Uh, for many, 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 many decades, um, that was done. But it is strategically useful for a president who is uh, trying to keep a promise uh, to, to overrule Roe versus Wade to nominate somebody who goes through the process without answering questions. Um, so there's less transparency. It's easier for a president to understand where the nominee is and for the public not to know that. And in a polarized environment, that's a dangerous combination. Another development is the uh, strong organization, particularly on, um, uh, on the part of the Federalist Society uh, and also the Heritage Foundation, uh, to become very involved over a long period of time in cultivating and developing the list of candidates. Uh, these are President these are two Trump. conservative legal organizations, right? Federalist Society. Yes, that's Foundation. right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when, when President Trump was, or uh, then nominee Trump, uh, was campaigning and uh, promising to appoint justices who would overrule Roe versus Wade and uh, release the list of people he might nominate to the Supreme Court, he didn't just draw up that list on his own or by consulting with uh, the American Bar Association or some neutral group looking uh, at, at credentials. That list came from uh, organizations which had lengthy histories and familiarities uh, with the views of the people on that list. So the chance that a president will be surprised by his or her nominee uh, is much, much lower now than it would have been in past decades. Yeah, I, you know, and I think another thing that is really different in, over these last several decades since, since Reagan is the uh, extent to which the, a president is very explicit about the promises uh, he's making in terms of judicial selection. I mean, President Candidate Trump made no secret of it. I'm going to appoint justices who will overturn Roe v. Wade. 30 years ago, Reagan, I don't think, would have been that explicit about it. He would have said, and there, were, there was a lot of talk, that there was a litmus test for judges uh, appointed by the Reagan Justice Department. But even Justice Kennedy, who was appointed by Reagan, I don't think was ever touted as someone who would overturn Roe v. Wade, they, they picked somebody who was Catholic, they looked at other factors you know, that they thought would make that person reliable on a set of issues. But I don't think they were as explicit as, as our politics have made these types of promises today. I think, I think that's right. And I think it's, um, I think it's dangerous uh, for the court and its reputation. Um, it is uh, uh, a, a very polarized time in our nation. The court uh, is one of the checks and balances, and Americans really care about checks and balances. Uh, and the idea that a change in the personnel of the court would be grounds for uh, the reopening of questions that had been authoritatively settled uh, really threatens the reputation and credibility of the Supreme Court as an institution. Right. Well, but I think we have. That's just, I think we have to assume for this conversation, Scott, that the new he is what President Trump has promised he would be a uh, a, a judge who, on the Supreme Court, would be reliable on this set of issues relating to Roe v. Wade. We may not, we may not be able to predict how to come, up, come down on a whole bunch of other issues, uh, but, but on this issue, President Trump has promised a justice who will overturn Roe v. Wade. Let, let's assume that's who he is. And then we have five, we have, we have eight remaining justices, four thought of as reliably conservative on this issue, meaning four fairly reliable votes to overturn Roe v. Wade. 
and for so-called liberal justices who are seen as reliably in favor of maintaining Roe v. Wade and not overturning it. With Justice Kennedy having a history on the court of siding with the four liberal justices on this issue, replacing him with someone like just uh, like Brett Kavanaugh would be the fifth vote. I mean, that's really what we're talking about on this issue, right? Brett Kavanaugh, if, if President Trump makes good on his promise, and if that's who this judge is, on the court, he represents the fifth vote to overturn Roe v. Wade. That's really what we're talking about. Here. That's essentially right. Justice Kennedy was a judge, a justice, I should say, who did not rule um, in favor of abortion rights in every case, meaning that there were many regulations concerning abortion that he upheld, uh, so long as they didn't mm-hmm. place an undue burden on women's uh, right to choose. However, in the most important cases, he affirmed the ultimate right, and we are looking at a situation where there would potentially be five justices who would vote to completely eliminate the constitutional right to abortion, which really means that what senators and Americans need to be looking for is, is not the sort of um, land statements uh, that, that we've seen in nomination hearings uh, for less pivotal Supreme Court seats, but really uh, a clear and compelling statement that the nominee supports our core legal precedents. Uh, it, it's probably, it may be known to you or, or some listeners, but seven in 10 Americans do not want to see uh, Roe versus Wade overturned. Uh, so this is a, a type of issue um, that we think there should be answers on. Well, let's to, if, to understand what would be the significance of a fifth vote to overturn Roe v. Wade. And there will be cases that will come up to the Supreme Court in the in the coming years that will address this issue. The court will have an opportunity to address this issue in the coming years, right? It's not like we're being theoretical here about something that might happen. This will come up in the, in the next year or two or three, right? Yes, absolutely. There, there are actually uh, almost 400 abortion restrictions that have been put into law at the state level uh, mm-hmm. in recent years, uh, since 2010 or so. And those laws continue to be passed. And organizations like the Center for Reproductive Rights continue to challenge them. And one of those cases, any one of those cases, could be a vehicle for the Supreme Court to address Roe versus Wade in the next year or two. It is uh, likely okay. that the court will address this issue um, and it will have a huge impact what they rule. All right. So to, so to understand what that huge impact may be, what that will look like, uh, we have to go back in time, and I want to just yeah. do that so people understand the, the, the really most pertinent background to, to bring us back up to the present. To do that, we really have to go to the year 1972. This is the year before the Supreme Court's ruling in Roe versus Wade. And describe, describe the, 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 the landscape, the legal landscape at that time, uh, because that's the landscape we're going to be going back to some extent, if if Roe versus Wade is uh, is overturned. So, what what was the world like in 1972 in this in this regard? Well, the bottom line is that women were getting abortions, but they weren't getting them legally, and they were dying. Uh, in 1972, abortion was permitted in a very small number of states, uh, really less than a handful, and mm-hmm. Uh, abortion was mostly illegal across the rest of the country. So women were uh, sometimes, if they could, if they had the means, traveling far across the country. Uh, Clergy were organizing to uh, help women in these desperate situations. Abortions were common. Um, It's estimated that there were approximately one million abortions per year in 1972, higher than 2014, the most recent year for which we have data. So yeah, I was going to bring that, that up. I mean, 
the, yeah, the number of abortions has been going down year after year after year. Uh, I think the peak was in 1990. Uh, but since 1990, the numbers have been coming down from almost a million and a half abortions a year to, I think it's something like 600,000 uh, in the most recent uh, year that we have information about that. Contraception, which is another of the issues that uh, Americans care very much about, and although it gets a little bit less um, of the spotlight in abortion, uh, has been a big, big part of that uh, change. And mm -hmm. the next Supreme Court, uh, these issues are, are related, and uh, we have case, there are, there are issues which may wind their way up to the Supreme Court concerning access to contraception too. Uh, another mm -hmm. uh, precedent from 50 years ago that most mm -hmm. Americans take for granted. Uh, but you know, the, the bottom line is, uh, people don't always know it, but approximately one in four women will get an abortion in their lifetime. Mm. And uh, it's, it's not that in 1972 there was no abortion and Roe allowed something to happen, uh, women getting abortion. What Roe allowed to happen is for women to get safe and legal abortion. Uh, before 1972, uh, before Roe versus Wade 1973, access would be shaped by race and by class. Uh, women who knew uh, a doctor um, who was uh, and, and could afford to pay the doctor, women who could afford to, to travel, they might obtain an abortion safely. Other women could not and would resort to desperate measures. The coat hanger is the infamous mm -hmm. uh, symbol from that era. Uh, some estimates are that there were thousands of deaths Per year, uh, if Roe versus Wade is overturned, uh, our organization has looked at this closely. We estimate that in 22 states, um, almost immediately, abortion would become uh, impossible to access and eliminate. There are many states which have so-called trigger bans on their books, which say mm -hmm. if the Supreme Court overrules Roe versus Wade, abortion is going to be uh, become illegal and criminal again. And there Instantly. are states... The moment that decision... What's that, sorry? I said, in other words, the, the, the law in those states says that the instant that the Supreme Court overturns Roe versus Wade, abortion is illegal throughout that state. Instantly. Yes, there might be some exceptions, um, to, you know, depending on the state uh, for... Mm -hmm. Uh, a rare uh, exception, you know, for example, if the mother's life is at risk, but mm -hmm. you would not have um, uh, access to abortion in uh, almost any circumstance, really. And there are other states which actually still have 1970s laws on their books, uh, which uh, are currently unconstitutional or not enforced. But if Roe versus Wade were overturned, would immediately become enforceable again. So, so. We, I mean, we could do a whole seminar just on Roe versus Wade and what it said and yes. why some people think it's great and why some people think it's not great. But the idea that the Supreme Court, with one ruling, can uh, set the standard, set a standard for, for a constitutional right uh, and, and set a universal standard across the country, I mean, that's... That certainly happened in Roe versus Wade, but but by but the first but that's one of the things that the Supreme Court does. I'm, I mean, I'm thinking about another issue that came up around the same time in history as Roe versus Wade: the Supreme Court invalidating state laws against racial intermarriage. I mean, until that happened in the Loving case, a state law could say that a a, a an African American could not marry a, a white person, and the Supreme Absolutely. Court said, "No, you that that is not, that is no longer the law in Virginia and in any other state where you would have that state law. We're stating, as a matter of federal constitutional right, that, that any such law that would dictate on that is invalid. So we know the Supreme Court can do that, and they did do that in Roe versus Wade. But give us." I mean, I know that you're you're obviously 
an, you know, an advocate on, on the issue of uh, reproductive rights. And, uh, but, but give us, uh, you know, give us a, a, a bit of a summary on this as to why what happened in Roe in 1973 was so important and also so controversial because it's been maybe the most controversial Supreme Court case of the last 45 years. So why, why was it important and why was it so controversial as well? The, uh, the era when Roe was decided was, as you point out, an era when many important decisions um, came down from the Supreme Court. Remember, in 1973, uh, women's equality uh, was not seen as embedded in the Constitution. It was, it was during the 1970s that the Supreme Court finally uh, dealt with that issue voting mm -hmm. rights, uh, bodily integrity, the right to contraception. Uh, all of these rights were being uh, recognized as constitutional by the Supreme Court in that time. And they're all related. Um, the Supreme Court has repeatedly recognized that when the 14th Amendment refers to liberty, that's the word used in the 14th Amendment, as well as equality, equal protection of the law, um, that that concept of liberty includes, among other things, uh, the right to make intimate decisions about family, relationships, bodily integrity, and autonomy. And Roe versus Wade was actually uh, pivotal in the development of this liberty doctrine. Uh, it sits within the, cent, uh, the set of essential rights um, that it, that uh, uh, that make liberty exist, and uh, weakening the right to abortion would be like pulling the thread. Uh, it would weaken what liberty means for everybody. Uh, Roe's opponents are wrong to think that the Supreme Court could overrule Roe versus Wade while leaving other liberty rights intact. There has been a lot of controversy and uh, in the years since Roe and continuing. However, there's a lot of vocal public advocacy by an, uh, a smaller portion of the population with very intense views. As I said before, 75 or 70 percent of women are I apologize, 70% of Americans are against overruling Roe versus Wade. And in one in four women will get an abortion in their lifetime. 60% of women who get an abortion are already mothers. Um, it's not something that people talk about publicly. People don't know yeah. how common yeah. it is and the reasons why people get abortions. Um, it's central to being able to plan a family, to be able to, be able to plan a life. It's central to liberty, and the controversy, um, in fact, uh, the, the masks a relatively quiet, but 70% majority in favor of keeping Roe versus Wade law of the land. Uh, there was a very important moment. Well, but in, I, want, in 19... I want to yes. explore... Well, no, I want to explore a little bit more, though, Scott, why... Because it... There are all sorts of uh, legal debates, you know, on particular aspects of law uh, that take place far from earshot of most Americans who are not lawyers, who are not constitutional scholars. Uh, but but this issue, this one, has, um, it, it, I mean, you can't, it, I don't think you can think of another issue that has, has for so long had such passionate um, you know, views on both sides. So as a matter of constitutional law, as a matter of what the Supreme Court does when it decides this issue, it's always seemed to me such a, such a very complex, um, you know, issue in terms of why there is this passionate opposition. I mean, one argument advanced by some, uh, like, like a Justice Scalia who stood for what some call originalism, you know, that the Supreme Court should only decide constitutional issues based on what the framers 
back in the 18th century thought about things. And since there's nothing in the Constitution that addresses abortion, the Supreme Court should lay off and not go near that issue. I mean, that's been one argument. You know, um, but, it, but on the other hand, it's always perplexed me because I think a strand of conservatism is an idea of the government not meddling in private affairs. But you brought up, uh, without, without mentioning it yet, the name of the, the case was the Griswold case that came out a few years before Roe that established a right to contraception. It's, it seems unimaginable to me that any conservative would think that the government should be in a position to tell men and women what they can and can't do in terms of contraception. Yet there is this fierce opposition to Roe um, by those who oppose it. It is fierce opposition. So as a matter of constitutional interpretation, you're referring to, to the 14th Amendment, to the liberty interest in, as, in support, but what, what are the arguments that you, you would need today as to why Roe should be overturned? If 70% support it, if, it, if you're right about the liberty interest in the 14th Amendment, what it stands for, what, what is the argument for overturning Roe v. Wade and why? I may not be the best person to advocate for arguments <laughs> to overturn Roe v. Wade, but I'll tell you well, what I'm I think about what you just to said. It's a good argument, but just to understand what, I mean, what, it seems... I, 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 here's how I see it. I, I think that certainly in, uh, among lawyers, um, this idea of originalism is a piece of it. It's interesting, though, um, uh, to, to look at what um, this argument about originalism uh, means. And it's interesting in two ways. First, at the founding, what the founders of the uh, of, um, world looked like for women, for people of color, is not the world we have today or the world we want today. And polling shows a majority of Americans are not in favor of originalism when interpreting the Constitution. And that polling has uh, never been um, stronger in that regard. Um, another thing about originalism, which is very interesting, is at the time of the founding, um, late 1700s, early 1800s, abortion was legal in the United States up until quickening, which is around uh, the fourth or fifth month when um, the fetus can be felt um, by the woman in her womb. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, that also was the doctrine of the Catholic Church and the Pope. And that had been true for a thousand years. Uh, it was in, in, 18, in the 1870s. Um, this is, you know, it's a Victorian area in England. Uh, the Comstock laws uh, get passed in the U.S., and they ban together contraception, abortion, pornography. Uh, at this time, women are not politicians. They're not in government. Mm -hmm. They're not judges. Mm -hmm. They don't have the right to vote. Uh, then a lot changes, and uh, I think some of the controversy, uh, continuing controversy, may still be um, some reaction to the changing role of women and men in society. Uh, I think some of the controversy results also from a confusion between people thinking about um, Abortion in their own content, in their own conscience, according to mm -hmm. their own spiritual imperatives, morality. The confusion between that Religious question view. and the question, mm -hmm. what should the law be? When people yeah. are asked the question in a poll in different ways, you get different answers. But when asked the question, whose choice should it be, the woman's or the government? Um, it's it's different and less confusing, I think, than. A, qu a question um, about the complicated, what some people might view as a complicated question of when life begins, and people have different answers on that for them themselves. Right. As to the possibility of change and, and what it means to have controversy for this many years, 
two of the things that occur to me first. One of them is Ireland. Uh, the Center for yeah. Effective Rights was involved in obtaining um, just uh, this spring, well, there were two rulings, but, but another just this spring, um, a ruling from the United Nations Human Rights Committee, the Ireland's abortion ban subjected women, a woman to cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment and called on Ireland to reform its laws. And that <laughs> a very Catholic country uh, nice. had a vote and changed its laws. And I'm, the second thing I'm reminded of is uh, sitting, I was sitting in the courtroom uh, in 2003 when the Supreme Court decided Lawrence versus Texas. That was a, a case which decriminalized homosexuality is, is, is how it was all put at the mm -hmm. time. Up until mm -hmm. 2003, you could be put in prison for having sex with somebody of the same sex. And when you look at where the country is today in 2018, I think you see that even on controversial topics, there really can be change. And the question is not, do people disagree? But what should the law be in a country where people disagree? Yeah. Well, so, okay. So we get, so Roe really, I mean, what, how, how can we distill Roe? Roe Ro sets the constitutional right. It doesn't, it doesn't legalize all abortion, right? It legalizes abortion, uh, and, and maybe we could put it as in terms of making it the woman's constitutional right to choose up to a point. Um, yes. I mean, right. So that, I mean, I think that's an important distinction to, to, to make clear as well. Yes, that's right. And uh, Roe had a trimester framework um, that contemplated different uh, types of government regulation at different points along the pregnancy. And the current constitutional structure is, is actually um, uh, really put forth most clearly in this 1992 decision, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which says, um, as a constitutional matter, uh, a woman has the right to choose whether or not to terminate her pregnancy uh, before viability, before the fetus can live outside the womb. And that after viability, the state can pass uh, regulations, even a ban, so long as there are exceptions for the woman's life and health. Before viability, um, the and, language and, of Casey... Mm -hmm. Yes, please. I was going to say, before viability, the language of Casey No, no, I was is, just... Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> the, the woman has the right to make the decision, but there is some room for the state to regulate so long as they don't impose an undue burden on a woman's uh, ability to make the decision. And in, and in that case, and this is, this is the only point I was going to add, again, to bring Justice Kennedy and his important role in, in this line of cases, in, this, uh, uh, in the unfolding and, and developing of this area of privacy and, and, and the constitutional rights involved, he is one of the justices who sides with those who find uh, it, it important to uphold Roe Ro versus Wade, to uphold the constitutional rights, uh, while, while constructing this framework where we balance the rights of the woman to choose and the rights of the unborn life. Uh, he's one of the justices who comes to the side of, uh, of, of supporting uh, Roe versus Wade in that 1992 Casey decision, right? That's exactly right. And one of the most important things about Casey is that it squarely addressed the fact that abortion was controversial, that people disagreed. And there was a request in, in Casey that the court uh, overrule Roe versus Wade. And Justice Kennedy cast the deciding vote, reaffirming Roe's essential holding that a woman, not the government, has the ultimate right to decide whether to terminate a pregnancy before viability. The Casey decision went on for pages talking about the importance of precedent and stare decisis, um, the Latin phrase for lawyers, meaning the, uh, that a precedent should be adhered to, um, that it's the foundation of the rule of law, that we don't change um, uh, uh, precedent um, merely because uh, there's a new uh, 
Supreme Court justice on the court. And uh, it went on at length explaining the, the, the types of disagreements Americans have and that ultimately it is the woman's decision that nobody can impose motherhood on her. And the court in Casey also really wrestled with and explained in clear terms how overruling Roe would damage the legitimacy of the court and said that Roe had, uh, quote, rare and, quote, strong precedential force um, because of how important it had been in the lives of millions of Americans, of a generation of women who had come to age uh, relying on Roe and the equality um, for women that it creates. Casey talked at length about how the ability of women to participate equally in the economic and social life of the nation is facilitated by their ability to control their reproductive rights. And Casey looked backwards 50 years to the court's 14th Amendment liberty jurisprudence concerning dignity, autonomy, personal decision-making, how you get to educate your children, uh, mm. wh how you can form your families, who you can live with, um, all sorts of private decision making, and said that the the right to control your own body is at the heart of the liberty protected by the 14th Amendment. Four justices would have overruled Roe versus Wade and Justice Kennedy, the swing vote uh, who is up to be replaced, was the deciding vote in preserving Roe versus Wade in Casey, where it really wrestled with the issue of stare decisis. Um, there's very few cases that are both so strong a precedent for a fundamental constitutional right and so strong a precedent on the very issue of precedent itself as Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Mm -hmm. Well, and I wrote this down. Uh, this is a quote from that Casey decision where the uh, the, the justices who, uh, who who were speaking of, including Justice Kennedy, wrote uh, matters involving the most intimate and personal choices a person can make in a lifetime, choices central to personal dignity and a fourteenth amendment. That's that's really it. Seems to me that's the heart of the the ruling that you're talking about in this liberty interest. Um, that, that, that Roe stands for when it comes to abortion, but as you also point out, in, in a whole host of other really important uh, personal liberty issues that the Supreme Court has taken on. So uh, let, let, let's break that down a little bit, Scott, because what, one, one implication of a fifth vote to overturn Roe versus Wade, of course, is what that means in terms of access to abortion in the United States of America. And let's, let's start there. And then I want to, I want to move to some of these other areas that we've, we've alluded to, uh, and just say a bit more about that. So we've already talked about the fact that, uh, and the, I know the Center for Reproductive Rights is, you know, does a kind of ongoing state by state by state monitoring, uh, of state laws to see which states are most likely to uh, uh, have anti-abortion or a a laws again uh, illegal, making illegal abortion once again, and you you've indicated that there are as many as 22 states right now who, if 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 Roe versus Wade is is overruled, women could find uh, themselves unable to get an abortion in those states. Um, what what are the other potential implications in terms of access to abortion that that you see uh, in a in a uh, world the day after or in the weeks after the Supreme Court overrules Roe versus Wade if in fact that happens well there's two possibilities um, one is that the Supreme Court overrules Roe versus Wade one is the possibility that the Supreme Court uh, hollows out Roe versus Wade guts it without formally overruling it. What that would look like would be basically taking the current legal standard, which says the state cannot unduly burden the woman's right to access abortion, and reweighing the balance. So in 2016, 
uh, the Center for Reproductive Rights brought a case to the Supreme Court called Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstedt. It concerned some Texas regulations which uh, saddled clinics with um, expensive, not medically necessary regulations and were on the verge of shutting down three quarters of Texas's clinics. And we argued, and Justice Kennedy agreed, that that type mm -hmm. of restriction on access is an undue burden. So a state can try to overregulate um, to create uh, deserts <laughs> of abortion access. In fact, there's approximately a half dozen states right now where there's only one clinic left. Uh, you could see a situation where the Supreme Court doesn't overrule Roe, but when it decides um, what's an undue burden, uh, it weighs the balance more heavily in favor of the state and essentially never meets a restriction it doesn't like. Uh, mm -hmm. That would lead to an even worse patchwork of access where some states would regulate abortion so heavily that many women in the state would no longer have access. And that burden would fall especially hard on women who are poor, low income, and women mm -hmm. of color, women who are already facing um, uh, multiple forms of oppression in difficult circumstances. And and as we mentioned, I think it's really the beginning when we were talking about the world before Roe versus Wade. It's not gonna it's not gonna eliminate abortion in this country, right? I mean, w women are still going to get abortions uh, as they did in 1972 and the years before that. It's it's just going to be much much more difficult. It's, they may face legal penalties. They may they may face all sorts of health risks. Uh, and, uh, and and many other women who who want uh, an abortion won't be able to get one at all. But it's not going to overturning Roe versus Wade is not going to eliminate abortion in this country. Well, the other possibility, which we haven't discussed yet, is that although in the first week after Roe versus Wade, hypothetically, um, faces a real challenge and overruled, things would happen at the state level and states have been very active in recent years in restricting access. Mm -hmm. There's also the possibility that the federal government, the Congress, freed of Roe versus Wade, could write a law eliminating abortion. If Roe versus Wade is not on the books, Congress could eliminate, try to eliminate abortion potentially. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing to mention is that it's not that um, it's not so facile for many women to obtain abortions that some women, uh, women with means, women who could get on a plane to another country, to another state, who could fly to New York, um, they might be able to obtain abortions. Women in Mississippi, women in rural areas, uh, women who are hundreds of miles from any clinic, not so much. And another issue which um, is, is really related here is women's health in general. This is when clinics close, it's not just a abortion that disappears. These are centers where women get all sorts of care, um, cancer screenings, contraception, other types of health care. Um, we've seen situations in Indiana and then in Texas where clinics got shut down by restrictive state laws. And in Indiana, for example, there was then an HIV outbreak. And in Texas, maternal health during delivery got terribly worse. Texas mm -hmm. is currently the most dangerous place in the developed world to carry a child to term and bear a pregnancy. A pregnancy is 14 times more risky uh, health-wise than uh, obtaining an abortion. Obtaining an abortion is safer than a penicillin shot. I don't say, just say that flippantly. That That is a medical fact that the Supreme mm -hmm. Court recognized uh, the safety of abortion and the whole women's health versus Hellerstedt issue we, we brought. Um, the United States is one of the, is the only country in the developed world where maternal mortality uh, rates are rising, where pregnancy is becoming more dangerous as the years go by, 
while in other countries it's falling. Um, the shutdown in clinics would have devastating consequences for women. This is not just a question of cons constitutional rights. This is a question of women's lives. And abortion, well, you, you although... Know, yeah. No, Scott, you raised, you raised an interesting question, though. You said that one possible uh, follow-up to the Supreme Court overruling Roe could be Congress passing a law making abortion illegal throughout the country. But, uh, and this is something I've actually always wondered about, Congress could also pass a law, couldn't it, making it legal? So the, the legal issues involved with congressional power to regulate this issue um, haven't yet been explored in the way they would be explored after Roe versus Wade, um, if, if it should be. Um, weakened uh, or, or, or overruled by the Supreme Court. Um, all I can say is I worry about a country where mm -hmm. people's core liberty rights uh, fluctuate and where people's access to health care and the ability to make decisions about their uh, families, about their life trajectories, are no more secure than a roll of the dice or what happens in the next election. Well, I want to I want to cover one last area, Scott. We we've, we've, we've mentioned it. Uh, I'm sure those information hearing uh, that will come up um, regarding Judge Kavanaugh. Uh, we're going to hear this Latin term that lawyers know, stare decisis. Uh, this idea of the Supreme Court uh, respecting precedent in in, uh, in its prior rulings, but I, I want you to say a bit more about what that really means, because I know again we're going to hear those words and there'll be platitudes and people say I respect stare decisis, but the, the issue involved here with abortion rights and Roe versus Wade goes much deeper and broader than just that issue. Um, so, so talk a little bit about how the Roe versus Wade decision has become part of the fabric of constitutional law as the Supreme Court has defined it in other contexts, and why, therefore, a decision to overrule Roe versus Wade could place in jeopardy uh, all sorts of other personal rights and personal liberties, and probably most of us aren't even really thinking about that, because we're really just thinking in you know, in a binary way, the row will be overturned or it won't be, but the implications of overturning it are great in terms of these other issues that the Supreme Court has decided. So to say a bit about that, because I know that that's a really important issue as well. It's tremendously important. Roe was the foundation for a broad swath of constitutional law uh, that protects our right to make decisions about marriage, procreation, contraception, family relationships, child rearing education, and more. Um, for example, uh, after Roe, in a case uh, called Le Fleur, uh, the Supreme Court struck down a collection of school policies that required pregnant teachers to take unpaid leave starting up to five months before giving birth and for three months after giving birth. The court cited Roe for the liberty protected by the 14th Amendment. Uh, the decision that you mentioned earlier uh, concerning contraception, Griswold, actually ruled that married couples could use contraception. That's nice, <laughs> but it was restricted <laughs> to married couples. It evolved mm -hmm. over the years. There was a decision called Carey in uh, the late 70s that really put the right to contraception on a more solid footing. What did it cite? Roe versus Wade. Mm. Marriage equality. What did marriage equality and uh, other um, uh, cases in which, again, Justice Kennedy was the swing vote, what did uh, the gay rights decisions of the last uh, two decades rely on? Roe. Um, your right to medical decision-making is implicated by Roe. Your uh, right to bodily integrity is protected by Roe. 
for example, um, uh, there's an old case in which the Supreme Court had held that the right to liberty protected a criminal defendant from having the government jab a tube down his throat, inject solution, and force vomiting in order to recover evidence of drug possession. Well, when Casey was decided in 1992 and reaffirmed the importance of stare decisis and laid out specifically where abortion is in the continuum, that was its word, continuum, of protected core personal liberty rights, it cited back to that case involving the criminal defendant. Uh, the 14th Amendment doctrine concerning personal liberty, it's a Jenga tower. And if you pull out row, that tower <laughs> may not stand. And what, what, what matters um, when we look at a, at a future case is not just whether a future nominee is not just whether a nominee um, uh, utters platitudes about um, precedent, but whether they affirmatively state that they uh, will protect the core liberties that Americans care about including a statement that the candidate agrees that the Constitution protects an individual's right to make personal decisions uh, concerning termination or following through with a pregnancy. So to, to really try to put the sharpest point on it, if the court with Justice Kavanaugh sitting in former Justice Kennedy's seat uh, overrules Roe versus Wade, uh, just for example, uh, do you see a risk to the Supreme Court's recent holding on uh, marriage equality, same-sex marriage? Uh, I don't want to speak for advocacy groups uh, or scholars who are real experts in that area, but I would point out the following. Uh, as a nominee to the Supreme Court, uh, Judge Neil Gorsuch um, talked about the value of precedent. Uh, last year, um, he would have supported overruling a host of cases involving numerous diverse clauses of the Constitution. And the year before that, there was uh, a decision that flew under the radar a little bit uh, called Pavan. Um, it involved uh, same-sex couples uh, seeking to have their names on their children's birth certificates. And the Supreme Court, um, noting that uh, at least one of the plaintiffs in um, the main marriage equality case, Obergefell, uh, had been seeking that same relief, said, this case is easy. Justice Gorsuch, who during his nomination hearing had made statements generally supporting precedent, expressed the view that um, in that Pavan case, that the law was, quote, that the issue was, quote, not settled, and that he saw no constitutional problem with laws that are, quote, biology-based. Uh, I don't know what to uh, predict. Um, I do know that in Masterpiece Cake Shop, the case just this year about a gay couple who sought a wedding cake and uh, was refused it. Justice Kennedy wrote a lengthy decision that um, ruled for the baker on very narrow grounds, particular to the case, but also spoke at length about the importance of equality and dignity for people, mm -hmm. um, including gay people. Justice Gorsuch wrote a lone opinion in which he and no other justice not only ruled against the gay couple seeking a wedding cake, but also questioned the leading Supreme Court constitutional precedent that established the very framework for evaluating these issues. When a nominee says, yes, I value precedent, it doesn't mean they will always adhere to precedent. And uh, the rights uh, recognized by Justice 
Kennedy in his swing opinions concerning abortion and concerning sexual rights are very much intertwined. They borrow from each other and they recognize the importance of a sphere of intimate personal decision making that the government doesn't have business regulating. Because people in our country may disagree on these issues, but ultimately, these issues, these questions, some of the most consequential decisions in a lifetime, are for the individual to make. Scott, uh, Scott Rusty, kid of the Center for Reproductive Rights, I want to thank you very much for this conversation, for exploring these uh, obviously super, extremely important issues. Uh, we will be watching very closely to see what information, uh, and then uh, assuming he's confirmed, uh, watching uh, very closely uh, to uh, see what happens uh, as these cases continue to percolate in front of the Supreme Court. Um, thank you again for uh, being on the program. I'll make sure that uh, people know how to reach you in the description for this episode and how to get more information from the Center for Reproductive Rights as well. Thank you so much again, Scott. Appreciate it. Aaron, it's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much.